Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The text says that Jesus led Peter and James and John up a high mountain apart and by themselves. The disciples had been witnesses to many things as devoted followers of Jesus. They had seen the ill be healed, the possessed exercise, and the dead walk. They had seen Jesus advocate for the marginalized walk on water, and just days before had seen Jesus feed thousands with just a few loaves of bread. They had seen so much. And yet their presence at these holy, life-altering events for so many did not translate into understanding of who Jesus truly was. In chapter 8, Jesus demonstrates some frustration with the disciples. He says, do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And the disciples say, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And the disciples say, seven. And so Jesus responds, do you not yet understand? No, they didn't. They didn't understand. And so I imagine Jesus taking a deep breath and thinking, okay, let's try this again. And so he persists and continues to bring them along for the journey. And on this journey, they witness yet again another miracle. They witness Jesus cure the blind man of Bethsaida. And it seems as though they're beginning to get it because Jesus asked them, who do the people say that I am? And Peter dismisses people's claims of Jesus being John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets and says, you, you're the Messiah. And so I can imagine Jesus sharing a proud smirk and thinking they weren't paying close attention before, but maybe now, maybe now they're getting it. This is good. We're getting somewhere. And so Jesus reveals himself to the disciples for the first time as Messiah And as Messiah, he reminds them that he must suffer. He says the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by his elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And Peter, the one who got it, the one who dismissed all other assumptions and recognized Jesus as the Messiah, upon hearing this, he says, excuse me, Jesus, can we talk for a second? And the text says that he takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. The text doesn't say, however, what it is is that Peter told Jesus, but it does say that what Peter attempted to do privately, Jesus does publicly. Jesus immediately turns to the disciples and rebukes Peter, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Just as Jesus had revealed to them that he was the Messiah, Jesus now reveals to the disciples that to follow the Messiah meant the adoption of a cruciform life. To follow Jesus did not mean they would go from miracle to miracle, from blessing to blessing, from glory to glory, but instead to follow Jesus meant to carry their cross and bear the weight of the world's brokenness as well. I'm thinking that when the disciples thought of Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah that had come to save them, they had thoughts of power and magnificence, not of what Jesus was talking about here, of suffering and death. I'm also thinking, though, that Peter's rebuke came from a place of confusion, precisely because of the ideas he had created of what it meant to follow the Messiah. I think his rebuke also came from a place of pain. It hurt Peter, and I'm sure the disciples too, to hear that their leader, their savior, their friend would be rejected and persecuted and ultimately killed. I have to imagine that even though Jesus sees it necessary to admonish Peter, to shake him into reality, he knows his disciples are struggling with their imminent loss. 
I think it's because of this that he invites Peter, James, and John up that high mountain by themselves for yet another opportunity for them to finally get it. It's as if Jesus was saying, we've been around a lot of people for a while now. Everywhere we turn, there is a crowd and work to be done. Everything you've seen has been for the sake of temporal healing and restoration. I want to show you something that transcends the here and now. I want you to see why I must endure the cross. And so they walk up and get to the top of the mountain, and lo and behold, Jesus is transfigured right before their eyes. Jesus' clothing becomes dazzling white. What's so great about this text is that Mark tries to describe a scene unlike any other, and because of that, he seems to struggle to find words that do justice to what's happening here. Jesus' clothes, he says, became dazzling white, and he adds, like no one on earth could make them. It's as if Mark is saying, you just don't understand. They were whiter than white. They were da more dazzling than dazzling, like nothing you've ever seen. And if this isn't enough, Jesus is then joined by two figures from the past, Moses and Elijah, representing the law and the prophets, and in this sense, the heart and essence of Israel's history. Imagine that. The disciples thought they had seen it all, but now they are seeing not just another miracle, but a true vision of the foretaste to come. Peter is between elated and terrified. The text says he doesn't know what to say, but as usual, it doesn't stop him from speaking. Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, that we may come to visit. He wants to live in this foretaste. He wants to capture it and, and bottle it up, making a dwelling place while he can, even while he and the disciples had already been told where the Christian journey would take them. Peter sees the transfiguration before his eyes and has fallen back on his constructed dreams and not on what he has heard from the Messiah himself. Peter is wanting to hold on to the glory before him, to the potential shortcut to the kingdom of God by eliminating the dimensions of suffering and death. What he's failing to accept is that the glory of transfiguration, although present before them, will not be consumed except through the cross. And so what happens next is yet another rebuke. Except this time it doesn't come from the incarnate God, it comes from God the creator. A cloud overshadows them and God speaks, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Stop planning. Stop feeding your delusions. Just stop. Look at the splendor. Bask in this foretaste of glory and believe what you hear from the embodiment of truth. You will dwell in this glory, but for you to live in this splendor, I will suffer. I will be rejected. I will die. Church, note that on either end of Lent, we have Jesus on a mountain. Here we have Jesus on a mountain brighter than we can possibly imagine in all his glory. And on the other end of Lent, we have Jesus crushed, killed, and in utter darkness. The Jesus we have here is the one we want, the one we want to keep, bottle up, and dwell in all the days of our lives. And on the other end of Lent is the Jesus that we get, the one that through the painful and humiliating cross saves us from sin, the one that meets us in our personal, collective, and social suffering because he too knows personal, collective, and social suffering. This week begins a season and journey like Peter and the disciples, and like Peter and the disciples, we can name it, but we may not fully understand it. We may not really get it. We may not really want to let go of the glimpse of heaven we've experienced throughout the holidays or the brightness and splendor of the season of Epiphany. We may not really be looking forward to engaging the weight of the cross we're called to bear. 
However, it may, almost, it may also be the case that some of us here do get it. It may be that in this season we feel most at home, navigating in the dark in full awareness that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. In either case, this Lenten season, I ask that you envision Jesus taking you up a high mountain apart and by yourselves. Imagine basking in a moment of transcendence alone with your Savior, with your friend. The one that insists on taking you on this journey, even though at times you are absolutely clueless. And then imagine being overshadowed by the voice of the triune God. And listen. In Jesus' name, amen.